Uh, yo, yo, yo. Sup, people. How the fuck are we doing? Uh, it's been a crazy week in politics, and I am very much here to help. Here to scuba dive deep into the political abyss. Uh, seeks to, uh, what, so uh, Wash us all away in a tsunami of, uh... Uh... Poorly thought through sea metaphors, I guess. Uh... <laughs> A tsunami of financial chaos and government incompetence. That'll do. Um, how are you guys doing? Are you are you bearing up okay? It is chaos and mayhem. It's Friday lunchtime. And Quasi Quartang has just been sacked. Out the door. Gonzo. The only thing funnier than a Tory cabinet minister being sacked... Which, let's be real, right? There is, there's always going to be some novelty to that. You know, when we saw, when we saw how rarely it happened under Johnson, you know, like with Johnson, you could get away with anything. Johnson, Johnson, you could get caught fingering the receptionist while doing rails of cocaine. <laughs> and I reckon you'd probably get away with it. You know, even if it like, if it leaked to the press, he'd be like, well, I, 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 um, I accept the, uh, the, 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 the right honourable gentleman's uh, explanation. I accept that. Uh, uh, that he was, he, he was testing his eyesight and physical ability. Uh, and, merely, and merely testing that it was indeed cocaine uh, 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 rather than, than enjoying it. Uh, or, or indeed the, the act of uh, fornication. Which, which it has to be said, I have it on good authority that Labour do also at times fornicate so uh, i consider the matter closed like that that was the sort of johnson kind of response to a scandal wasn't it <laughs> to a fuck up just sort of i accept his explanation close the book fine that's it game over done um he did it with patterson he did it with uh cummings um there was someone else as well wasn't it where he was just like i consider the matter closed everyone was like oh fucking really <laughs> But this one is funner. This one is funnier. Because there's the novelty of it happening, firstly, but also double comedy value. From, from the fact, like, he was emphatic yesterday. He, he was 100% confident that he would still be, co like, Chancellor in a month, wasn't he? 100% <laughs> confident that I will still be Chancellor in a month. Yes, I'm not going anywhere, is what he said. And good for you, Quasi. I like it. I'm here for it. It takes some people years of expensive therapy to acquire that level of self-confidence. Some call it delusion. Others, perhaps, arrogance. Detached, arrogant delusion. But no, self-confidence is what I see vapid and vacant and devoid of all justification though it may be it is there a hundred percent confident i'm not going anywhere he said it's amazing this is the same guy the same chancellor who said he bet big on britain do you remember that that was like three weeks ago four weeks ago he said, oh, I'll never apologise for betting big on Britain. Same guy who said he wouldn't be flying back early from the IMF. I've got no plans to come back early. No, no, no. Why should I? No, I'm here. I'm at the IMF for a reason. I've no plans to fly back early. But who then did? <laughs> who said he would definitely still be in Chancellor in a month? Who, who didn't factor in the market reaction to his uncosted budget? Like, maybe... Maybe, Quasi, leave the predictions to somebody else, is my advice. Because you sound like someone's shit gambling uncle, is what you sound like. I'm never going to apologise for betting big on Britain. No, I won't fly home early. No, I'm definitely going to be Chancellor still in a month. These are all bets that you're making. You're a gambler. It's like somebody going like... um. I'm not ashamed 
to bet big on Rough Rider coming in first at Aintree. The guy's like, I mean, you like, you might not be ashamed, but Rough Rider went rabid yesterday. They shot her in the head. She's not racing, Quasi. Oh, right. I mean, I did tell you this before you placed a bet. Did you? <laughs> yes, I, I mentioned it three or four times. Oh, well, um, I'm not ashamed and I won't be quitting gambling. Like, are you sure you're cut out for this, Quasi? Yes, no, absolutely. I am not ashamed and I will never apologise for making that bet. Like, do you think maybe we should just explode into laughter whenever, like, any Tory tries to justify anything with... I will never apologize for... Like, you never apologize for anything anyway. <laughs> I will never apologize for betting big, big on... Big. When was the last time you apologized? Because if you never apologize for anything, there's very limited value in you saying, well, I will not apologize for this. <laughs> Nobody expected you to. Or when they say, I will never be ashamed to... Like, you don't know what shame is. <laughs> When was the last time any Tory was like, God, I am ashamed of this party? Like, when do you ever hear that? <laughs> do they know what shame is? <laughs> do you feel ashamed that you tried to starve those school children? Nope. <laughs> no, none. Nope. Absolutely no shame. And I don't feel it. Just, just don't have it in me at the moment. All oh, right. Okay. I mean, they're, they're literally starving just over there. Yeah, I know. It's just weird. Just don't feel it. Like, And then what? Like a bout of fiscal tomfoolery arises. They're like, I will never be ashamed to bet big on Britain. Well, yeah, no fucking shit, mate. <laughs> if you weren't ashamed to starve children, I didn't think it would come knocking, uh, you know, once the exchange rate starts tanking. Like, tell you what, guys, I was I was on board with hungry kids seeing who could eat their way to the middle of the slice of bread first. I can't keep my dick limp for that shit. But yeah, when it comes to the bond market moving by 2%, well, that is where my shame may kick in. Still probably won't, but it might. I mean, we're in the neighbourhood then. That's where my shame kicks in. I don't know about you guys, you heartless heathens. Have you no shame? at making a few pensions worth 1% less. So, yeah, I don't know. Shortly, we will have our fourth Chancellor in four months. In this mother of democracies, the mother of parliaments. We're supposed to be a stable political democracy. Fourth Chancellor in four months. Isn't that the sort of shit that you hear from, like, you know, third world banana republics? And the Chancellor of uh, Zimbabwe, or like, you know, an African country. I know that sounds incredibly ignorant, but you know what I mean. If it's an African country that's a bit dodgy, that you wouldn't necessarily move your money to. And they said they've got their fourth Chancellor in former. You'd be like, well, yeah, you know, that's what happens in <laughs> basket case economies like that. We're, we're the mother of parliaments and democracies and, you know... We're supposed to be a bit better than this, aren't we? Now, who were they again? Let's let's wind back a little bit. It was Sunak, Zahawe, Kwartang, who's now gone. I think Jeremy Hunt is being mooted. Sort of, he's. I saw him described earlier as you know to somebody that would appease the left of the Tory party. Jeremy Hunt is not. I mean, he styles himself now as a sort of moderate because he has moderate views on Brexit uh, and because he went for the leadership against Boris Johnson, who was, you know, by any stretch, a bit of an authoritarian, a bit right wing, a bit dog whistly, a bit, you know, letter boxes and tank top bum boys, you know, so Hunt appeared to be something more of a moderate. But I mean, he savaged the NHS for about five years or some shit, didn't he? He's, I, I don't necessarily think we can describe him as, you know, left quite yet. But it, anyway, it may not be him. So, yeah, fourth chancellor in four months after this fucking mess. I will say this for this this little episode. Yes, it's been scary. 
Yes, I'm terrified that I will lose the family home. Yes, we are circling the drain about to fall into the financial abyss that could take Western capitalist society with us. But at least we have a new term to throw about. To quartang something. <laughs> it's just, you know, phonetically, it just works. Guys, I don't know how many of you are, you know, lovers of language. Word nerds. I don't know how many of you, you know, really appreciate good phonetics or like well-structured sentences or whatever, but to, to quartang something, to biblically horsefuck it, like it's, it just, to quartang, it just rolls off the, the tongue, no? Like I said on the TikTok this morning, it is it, like it's just perfect for when you mean something that you you know you've royally horse fucked it like um you know like a, a boss talking to his colleague or employee you know like div did you merge all 50,000 client folders at the same time and he's like i oh yeah yeah bill i did i i know i know it's frozen the system frozen the system dave it's absolutely quartang that i know, i know bill i know i'm sorry it's quartanged. It's just, you know, it just sounds right, doesn't it? It's like that Peep Show episode where they go, oh, he's totally jezzed it. Like, it just, it it works for that kind of scenario to mean that thing. Anyway, look, will, will Truss go with him? That's the question now. I don't see how she doesn't call an election at this point. She, like, she already had no mandate. She was already trying to rule with a radical new agenda that was so far outside of the manifesto that the Conservative Party were elected on. With no electoral backing, and, you know, and now she's shown that that agenda is a disaster and still with no mandate. I don't see how she can credibly say at this stage, yeah, stick with me. You know, I, I know what I'm doing. This is what you voted for. I don't see how she can do that. And it's like, is anyone, is anyone seriously out there thinking, yep, Truss has this in hand, you know, steady as she goes. Like, I, I don't see how you can look at this chaos and go, yep, it's all part of the plan. I'm sure she's, she's handling it well. Like, this idea that there's a team of advisors in number 10 looking at the male's headline which is today like you know she has 17 days to save her job it's was it 17 or 20 or, or something but that was the gist of it. it's like she has you know a matter of weeks if that to save her job the fact that that's on the mail front page today is hilarious in itself like the same newspaper the same editors who were hyping her up a month ago and now they're like nah she sucks <laughs> Like, we're so erratic and urgent and immediate in this country. You know, we used to save the instant gratification for our, you know, sexual mores. And because we're repressed fucking Brits, we just keep that shit balled up. And now not only do we, we want immediacy in politics, but we just serve it up to the electorate via the press by the shovel load. Instant. You know, like only a, a couple of weeks ago, it's like, I like trust. She's the Iron Lady 2.0. She's not for turning. She's low tax. She's a real Tory Brexiter. In Liz we trust. And now three weeks later, chaos everywhere. The end of days. Mortgages, pensions, bonds, the city. Your plumbers help to buy flat. Everything's on fire. And now they're like, yeah, she sucks. Next. <laughs> It's like sort of, you know, X-Factor politics, isn't it? It's like, nah, I liked you last week, but this week you suck. Bye. Anyway, this idea that there's this, you know, team of advisors in number 10 who was, you know, like, yeah, this is part of you. Don't worry, Lizzie. Don't worry. It's fine. Everything's going to be fine. Like, there is some deliciousness to that, that it's the same sort of, you know, dismissive, Brexity, um, uh, fucking 
you know, project theory stuff as is served up to the rest of us. Like, oh, come on. Oh, no, it will never. No, it's it's fine. Don't worry about it. the same dismissive project theory stuff being said to her. I would love that. Like, don't worry about it, Lizzie. They're saying that I'm an idiot, though. Yeah, that'd nah, be all right. Be re Be fine. Anyway, look, it's a it's a scary, scary time out there, isn't it? Whichever way we shake it, benefits are likely to be cut in some capacity, I think. If not directly, then, you know, via support structures. And those support structures will be the sorts of things that the most vulnerable people will rely on. And your rents are likely to go up and gas and electric, you know, we know about already. And of course, you know, if you're on a mortgage as I am, you must be shitting your tits through the looking glass and wonder what the fucking point was of slogging your guts to get on the ladder if the government are just going to, you know, clamber in like circus clowns, bashing cymbals and smash the fucking place up with their dribbling incompetence. You must be wondering that as I am. You know, what was the point? Why did I work hard and get to this level and earn this amount? and save this money to get on the ladder, finally, to have it all swept away in somebody else's incompetence. You must be wondering that. I mean, how the Conservative Party will ever be able to claim to be the party of hard work and getting on and making something of yourself if this all goes as it appears to be heading? How they can ever claim to be the party of fiscal responsibility after this is beyond me. It's just like the pair of them, like just utter fucking lunacy. The more I read about it, honestly, the angrier I get. And I tried to keep shit upbeat and, you know, roasty and fun and parodic on this show. But it's just, you know, it gets me fucking livid. They're just, you know, careering into the world of geopolitical finance with the same witless substanceless fuckery that they did with Brexit. But now instead of it only fucking over a few, you know, fishermen or only closing a factory a couple of hundred miles away from you, now the contagion spreads or, or whatever, you know? You know, this sort of fact-free fuckery, this Brexity boosterism has bled out to the city and now it's banging on your door. Now it's like, hey, remember me? Remember me? I, I was telling you that everything was Project Fear when, when we were leaving the single market. Well, now I'm back to throw a fucking hand grenade into your pension and your mortgage. And wait, 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 wait. I, I, yeah, I know what you're going to say. Have you thought this through? Where's your workings? This might horse cunt the economy, but yeah, just, yeah, I'll be fine. Don't worry. Oh, rubbish. Growth, growth, growth. It'll be fine. Like our two year fixed is up in August next year, right? Here's some realness for you. And I honestly don't see how we're going to pass the, you know, affordability checks to retain the house. My girlfriend tells me not to worry about it. She works in property. She's the sort of money man. So I'm like, all right. I mean, if you say it's all going to be OK, then fine. But to my mind, I don't see how it's how we're going to survive it. You know, it won't be a repossession. In the sense of, you know, bank people rapping on the door, you know, knock, knock, get your shit and get out. It, it, like, I don't think it'd be like that. It'll be a disappointing phone call. Trying to remortgage. You know, it'd be some nice lady in a Edinburgh call centre. Like, sorry, unfortunately, our calculations suggest that you cannot proceed with the application. And then, you know, it'll be a suggestion that we put the house on the market and then we'll move into that tier of people who all don't pass the affordability checks at the same time and who all must sell and so then what like a deluge of properties will come on the market of people desperate to sell quick and so the value of homes will tank and we could end up selling our home for the same or less than we bought it and come out, you know, paying private rent down the road for a shitter place. <laughs> and the rent for that would have gone up. 
So we could come out like not having made any money on this house, renting a shitter place and still owe the bank like 10 grand, 20 grand. And it's like, how the fuck? Like we bought the house. How have we ended up in debt to the bank? And somebody would be like, well, that's capitalism, guys. Thanks for playing. See you later. And like, it's so hilariously depressing. Which I suppose is that, because that, that's sort of the USP of this podcast, right? Like, take the muck and awfulness of life and try to crack a joke or two, you know, here and there. But it's, it's like, you know, here's, right, here's how the call should go, to my mind. Here's how I want that call to go to the bank, to the Edinburgh <laughs> customer service banky thing. Like, I'd be like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to remortgage, please. Right, well, you can't afford this house anymore. Oh, right. Um, I mean, I could afford it before, though. Right, but then the mini budget happened. And, you know, the Bank of England had to hike interest rates. And we have to pass that cost on to our customers. And so now this house has simultaneously tanked in value, but also become more expensive. <laughs> huh? How does that work? Well, you bought it for 350, but no, because everybody's selling it, it's only worth 300. But also, for you to buy it at 300, you have to be earning a million pounds, a million pounds a year now, to buy it at less value. Right? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the Bank of England raised their rate to you, but it sounds like you need to talk to them about this, because like we live in a house. And we bought it for 350 and I'm happy to paying, like, carry on paying that at the same rate that I was. I mean, I'm reasonably happy with the product. It's, it's got a roof and a toilet, so that's fine. But, yeah, I mean, it sounds like a supply chain issue on, on your side, to be honest. So, do you want to maybe give them a call? Get back to me? Like, <laughs> that's how I want it to go. This sounds like a you and the Bank of England problem. I don't see why I need to be involved. <laughs> I suppose it's because like, I don't fully understand why raising mortgage rates is so essential. That's the thing. It's always like the go-to thing. They never really contextualize that. They say, well, you know, this, this probably means the Bank of England are going to have to raise mortgage. Like, why? Why are you making my life more difficult? <laughs> why was it when there was inflation coming from gas and electricity prices and everyone's already broke and it's causing inflation? Why is it then the natural go-to that the Bank of England are like, well, I see everyone's broke, so obviously we have to raise interest rates. Like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I'm already broke. Why are you trying to make me more broke? Like, why is it never contextualised? Like, is it that? Here's, here's, well, like the logic that my brain tries to wrap around. Like, is it, though, as though... um. If there's a load of tax cuts, then that's less money going into the exchequer, right? Less money into the treasury. So then the bank have to make up for it. Like, well, you know, we have to ensure that we still have 20 billion in the treasury over five years. So we're going to have to make mortgages way more profitable. So when aid borrows 280 grand... Now he'll have to pay more into his bank, who will then in turn pay more to the Bank of England because the banks get their money from the Bank of it, right? So there's a chain there. So if I pay more to my bank, who then pay more to the Bank of England, it makes up the shortfall. Like, is that it? So the tax cuts, they got to make it up. So then, the, like, is that what's happening here? And so then, you know, the fact that Trust signed off on these tax cuts without saying how she would pay for them to compensate the treasury is that the reason why the bank of england had to do this because that would kind of make sense ish but as i say like i'm like i'm not a, an economist i don't know this stuff for sure i'm just saying logically that kind of stacks up but then here's the thing right why can't they just put this shit on the banks why can't they just go, OK, so 20 billion in tax cuts, raise interest rates to the banks, to your Lloyds, 
Santander, Barclays. That will steady the housing market. Hopefully prevent a crash, you know, because it's like it's going on to the the banks, but the banks aren't passing it on to the customers. Like, wouldn't that make sense? Effectively, like a price cap, but for mortgages. It's the exact same mechanism I'm talking about here. The same thing that's supposed to be rolled out to the energy companies, you know, where the increase, like the hikes are felt by the supplier rather than the wider economy. You know, you, me, your gran, your dad, your barber shop, like whatever. We're all protected from soaring energy bills there in theory because the energy companies then take the hit. They're capped. Like, could you roll that shit out to the mortgage world? Like Barclays made eight billion last year, eight billion. And obviously I'm not saying, you know, we take the eight billion and punish success and leave the bank, you know, penniless. I'm sure there are some listeners out there who are like, fuck the banks, burn them down. I'm sorry to tell you, I am not that much of a fire breathing lefty anarchist, you know, banks serve a purpose they generate wealth mostly for ferociously evil people who would who would let you and your family die if it provided them with a naught point naught 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 three percent uptick on their returns this quarter that's <laughs> they would but occasionally they do you know away days at charity allotments and you know pride my month fun runs so they're not all bad guys all right you have to take the rough with the smooth the hr team at barclays drape themselves in pride flags and shit so give them a break all right let them make 10 billion for fucking drug cartel oh no that was hsbc wasn't it <laughs> that was a few years ago they got caught out Anyway, I'm not necessarily saying we take all their money and, you know, ostensibly give it to homeowners. I'm just saying, give it to me. What? No, I'm not saying that. That's that's not right. I, I'm just saying cushion the blow a bit. You know, take a billion off Barclays, a billion off Lloyd's, a billion off Santander and so on, like Halifax, who like whoever, and slowly build up the 20 billion that you need to stabilize the market builds up the treasury right the pound gathers value again things look credible like how is that not a good idea a mortgage price cap protect the consumer while also collecting a bit more money for the treasury to to basically cost the tax cuts how does that not solve the problem am i being naive here perhaps and ignorant maybe Will I carry on anyway? Yes. <laughs> like, maybe there is a reason why these things aren't being discussed that I'm just, you know, unaware of. Because as I say, I'm not an economist. So what do I know? I had a chat with a journalist earlier uh, called John. And actually, I should probably find out his surname for you. Hold on two seconds so I can properly credit him here. John Jones. My apologies, John. I had a chat with him earlier and he was talking about how he was doing a piece on, you know, the effect on help to buy customers uh, of, of the current economic situation. And, and we had quite a lengthy chat about this mortgage price cap idea. And I floated it to him. I said, you know, is it workable? Is there a reason they could not do this? And I was expecting him to say something like, yeah, look, I mean, it's yeah, it sounds fun. It sounds easy. And, you know, it's a simple solution. But actually, Aid, what you're not factoring in is the something rate mechanism me thing. And, you know, Bank of England, uh, this team and initiative and like, you know, some economists reason for why a mortgage price cap would not work. And actually, the tail end of the conversation was this. It was it could work. You could protect consumers and it would have the effect that you're talking about, Aid. <laughs> it would protect everyone from mortgage rate. Like it would protect the housing market. And it would stop people like like me in my situation from having to, you know, basically 
double our mortgage payments next year and result in, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of home repossessions and evictions. Um, and, and the conclusion that we came to between the two of us was that you would ba basically have to convince banks to do this off their own accord. You would have to convince banks who, let's be real, quite like having money. They quite like having their own money. You'd have to convince them to to hand this money over, that it was a good idea. And I was like, could you do that just by saying, look, if you don't do this, we're all circling the drain here, mate. If you don't do this, capitalism itself is on shaky ground. If pensions go down, if mortgages go down, if the housing sector collapses, it it may not just stay confined to the UK. It might spread to the US, Canada, France, wherever. Do we need to take this thing seriously? And is it like, do we need to look at this like a reverse bailout? Like last time we saved you motherfuckers. Last time we funneled 40 billion into this bank and 60 billion into this bank and we saved you guys from collapsing. Well, now it's time to repay that motherfucker. <laughs> you each have to chip in a billion and make up this 20 billion to protect the housing sector from collapsing. Otherwise, the whole fucking domino rally starts to go. Like, is, is that the sort of conversation we need to have? And we kind of both agreed on it. We were like, basically, yeah. Mortgage rate price cap. I mean, we all, right. We all know it won't fucking happen, right? Because, because the government is so deeply wedded to the bank's that they just wouldn't ever tax them, would they? Like, like you think it's unlikely that the Tories would put a meaningful price cap or windfall tax in on energy companies? Well, fuck me. For banks, multiply that by 100. <laughs> I think the last estimate I saw was something around 15 million pounds makes its way from banks from the city of london into politics 15 million and that accounts for like politicians with second jobs who sit on the boards of these places to just outright donations from banks into the conservative party i say the tories because you know they're in power and they are most closely aligned with the city in in my opinion but it could also, this money could work its way in through lobbying firms and think tanks. Like, all that influence and friend buying. 15 million. I think it was Robin Williams who said that politicians should wear, like, corporate logos. <laughs> like, like NASCAR drivers do. I think it was him that said that. So you could then clearly see who was sponsoring them. You know, who had bought them. And if that were rolled out, in the UK, there would be a sea of politicians with little, you know, Barclays and JP Morgan and Halifax logos sewn into their TM Lewins. <laughs> I mean, we're talking we're talking about a class of people that would sooner sacrifice their firstborn child than ask a bank for so much as a meeting <laughs> to discuss this. And even if they did, right, it would be like this. It'd be like, um, hi, Bob. It's Liz. I've I've got um, Quasi or, or Jeremy here with me. Uh, we'd like to talk to you about a possible price cap on mortgages. And, and like the bank guy would just be like, <laughs> fuck off. Like, that's how that meeting would go. And if it's a good meeting, it would maybe last a minute long. It'd be like, well, um, no, I, you know, I think this is something we, we need to talk. Oh, really? Well, well I think. We'd like our 15 million back. Oh, uh, well, um, <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I thought. Uh, anything else? No, um, just see you at the members club on Friday. Yeah, uh, bye, Liz. Uh, bye now, bye, C call me. Like, that's, that's how that meeting would go. The leverage is just not there. It's like, you know, it's like a husband who fucked his wife's best friend and two of the bridesmaids and brought chlamydia back home to his wife and then after all of that shit he tries to apply pressure on something <laughs> like janet janet i would just 
prefer it if you went out on Wednesdays instead, because she'd be like, oh, f- oh, fucking really? You would prefer that, would you? Like, he has no leverage. Do you understand? Uh, Janet, I would prefer if you did. Oh, really? Well, I would prefer if you didn't empty your fucking balls in my best friend's ovary pond. But here we are, Jeff. Here we fucking are. That's how that would go. No leverage. Same thing. Only way something like this would happen, the mortgage rate price cap, only way it's happening is like either with a, you know, a Labour administration, which we still don't know how that's going to shake out. You know, we need to be real about that. Like I'm supportive of Labour over the Tories, obviously, but also we don't really know how, say, you know, socialist a Starmer cabinet would actually be. I know a lot of you have feelings about this already, but we don't know, okay? I mean, it has to be better than the Tories, right? For sure. But given that he's got to be, you know, fairly pro-business to maintain that centre-left space, and given the finance sector is both a, you know, a major generator for the UK economy, and that post Brexit, you know, f- our finance sector is is competing with, you know, Munich and Paris and Amsterdam. Like, take all of that into account. He's got to maintain a centre left space. He's got to be pro business. We have to compete with these other places that we didn't used to have to. It is a major part of our economy. Take all of that into account, and then ask how willing would Starmer be to effectively slap a billion dollar bill on these banks. That is an uncomfortable question, isn't it? But the other way that this could happen is, you know, if a colossal groundswell of media pressure rained down on the banks and either, you know, a price cap was pushed or a windfall tax was pushed on them, you know, like basically a clone of the energy stuff. When the papers really went to town, on the energy companies. That sort of media pressure might serve as a catalyst for seeing something like this happen. But I want to sort of, you know, set your expectations here. I want to just bring you back down to earth. The chances of seeing another 2008 style demonization of the bankers is slim right now. It's just, you know, I can't see it happening. And either they do that And then, you know, the Bank of England becomes ish sort of happy because they're getting their money. Then the pound settles. Or, you know, the alternative is that trust sticks with tax cuts and no way to pay for them. And the economy crashes and burns and we all lose our homes and pensions. And, you know, you you get the feeling, right, that the, uh, the, the only reason there's any debate on any of this is because trust is sort of backed into this corner now. And. It's basically a question at this stage on this overcast Friday afternoon, dear listeners. It is a case of, does she completely reverse all of her tax cuts or almost all of them? In which case she has no authority. She is just a cooked goose. Then to my mind, there would have to be a general election. She's just done. Or, you know, she buries her head in the sand, plows on with most of these tax cuts, this this continuing insistence that she can just do what she likes, uncosted, and, you know, and she'll just take the whole country down with her. And they appear to be the options right now. Anyway, that's it, guys. I'm sorry to leave you on such a, such a downer. If you enjoy these podcasts, uh, maybe consider jumping on the Patreon. We are having our first meetup on Thursday, the 27th of October, which is only a couple of weeks away. It is in East London where we're going to meet up and talk shit about Tories while enjoying a few beers. Um, You just have to jump on Patreon. Um, There's three tiers that you can choose from. The first is super cheap, starts at £3. That gets you early access, first listen access to all of the podcasts. I always put them up on Patreon first, unless it's uh, an emergency episode like this one. 
Um, then for five pounds a month, you start getting access to the Discord channel, which we have as well, where we all jump in there. We talk shit about Tories. We share memes. We talk about what's going on in politics and have a good laugh. Um, and then there's the ten pound a month tier, which I'm going to start doing a monthly ten pound God tier Skype call where I will join you for a beer once a month and you can ask me anything you like. We can talk shit. Uh, we can exchange ideas, thoughts and feelings about what's going on in politics uh, and indeed life, love and the universe uh, that week or that month. Um, so that's the Patreon. Um, if you're not in a position to support via the Patreon, that's fine. Obviously, it's a strange time for everyone. We're all feeling the pinch. Literally every one of us now, I think. Um, all I would ask is if you're enjoying the podcast, share it about. Just tweet it. Pop it on into WhatsApp, share an episode that you've enjoyed with a friend that you think might also enjoy. It. In fact, even an enemy, share it with an enemy that you think might enjoy it. Um, separate to that last piece of podcast admin, I promise, uh, I am looking for brands, partners who wish to maybe look at sponsoring the podcast. I could get your company name at the beginning and the end. I might put your logo or banner behind me on the video episodes where I'm interviewing guests um that is all coming up uh if you want to get involved in that then tweet at me at aid thompson uh, or indeed go on the funk 27 website so i always put all of the, the podcast episodes on patreon first but two days later they all go out onto spotify and apple podcasts um but i always keep a record of all of them and links for all of those episodes on funk-27 that's funk-27.co.uk uh, I also do a weekly blog on there, actually, if you're interested. It's sort of satirical, you know, dystopian uh, reflections of the week in politics. That comes out every Sunday on funk27.co.uk. So check that out also. Um, the next guested episode was originally going to go out tonight on Friday, the 14th of October. Obviously, I've done this emergency show now. So I'm going to put this one out and then I will put my interview with Dr. Robert Bush out uh, this coming week. So look out for that. We discussed COVID. We were reflecting back on that very weird time. And I asked him as a doctor... Uh, as uh, an academic, if he has faith for the future of the human race? Uh, and the answer might surprise you. But it also may not. Uh, if, if you're feeling a bit too optimistic about our future, maybe check out my interview with Dr. Robert Bush because it will, it will safely bring you back down to earth. I promise you. Uh, that's it from me. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks again to everybody for tuning in and I'll catch up with you soon. All right. Cheers. Ciao for now. We out here.